and welcome over to NLC Division 2. We are once again invading the mainstream and I'm joined by Bolt and Zahdas. Welcome guys. We have a lot to talk about before we go into game one of today. Venom Crest facing off against 42 because we have a new patch. 13.14 has arrived on the Rift and there's a lot of changes we're going to talk through real quick. Bolt, we may have a new king rising in the top side of the map. Tell us about it. Well, 13.14 is on, and sure, we might not have Nefiri, but there's another Darken that was raiding in the shadows, and now they're back, taking the full helm. Aatrox with actually one of the biggest buffs that I've seen in a very long time. That was just an egregious buff to the Q, and not just the damage itself, it's also the wave clear. The fact that it rises up to like 100% of the damage from, level, from rank 5. So Aatrox got a lot of agency in something that he was pretty weak early on, like when he was released and after the rework, which was the minion control. Now he has that, he has the damage, and Aatrox might be a force back. Harry Tops might become meta again. Yeah, and it's just really fun to see Aatrox back. It's been a while since we've seen him proper in pro play. But that's not the only lane that is seeing some changes over in the mid lane. We also have quite a few major changes, don't we, Zathos? Yeah, so it's not as spicy as Aatrox coming back into the meta and having all these hyper carries, but we may see the reign of LeBlanc finally come to the end because that shift is going to be of a change, meaning that the wave clear is going to be slightly harder to do as the damage has been decreased on that. However, the attack speed is going to be up, so maybe Tristana in the mid lane may get a little bit more power. And most importantly, Lissandra has been getting quite a decent nerf this patch. Actually having it where her Q will now slow enemy champions. Those ganks with her should be slightly easier to do. The ultimate as well did get a little bit of a heal increase. And then the damage as well got a bit of a buff. So Lissandra is something to watch out for this patch. Yeah, and these are the major buffs that have come out of this patch. Uh, patch. Meanwhile, a bunch of nerfs going around all across the other roles, including some of the jungle mechanics. Yeah, and that's gonna actually be pretty like differentiating how we play the game. First of all, the blue buff actually got a buff, not a nerf. So that's the consolation thing for every jungle player and everybody that's sharing that blue buff, is that eventually once you get past that level 11 barrier, you get extra ability haste. It's not more 10. It actually scales up to 20 by the time you level 16. But the red buff has had a very significant shaving of 50% of the slow. You have to get back to level 11 just to even out the nerf that has happened. So early ganks, especially by ranged junglers, might actually be a lot weaker. And, and these junglers that need that second power of the red buff will have a harder time to stick upon these champions without that extra slow. Yeah, and with Kindred, for example, eating an extra nerf along with the red buff nerf, it could be a little bit painful for players like Olonsky and Venomcrest, who have loved to play the champion, to go on with those kinds of picks. But last but not least, on the bot side of the map, a bunch of changes on support. AD carries, not so much that, though. Yeah, AD carries haven't been changed at all. The only small things you need to think about are the item, Trinity Force, a little bit of a nerf, so Ash might go a little bit more down stack, shift, bit of a buff. Kaisa's already strong, may even be getting stronger as she can first item that. But most importantly, two nerfs coming out to Rail and Melio. Rail's nerf is just going to be a little bit of base armor reduction, and her W is going to give a little bit less of a shield. One on the opposite side of Melio, just the speed up and shielding will be down, which kind of means engage support to back. We're going to see Nautilus a whole lot more, maybe even Leona and Alistar. It's a quite a big change for bot side. It is. And with all these changes coming up, we have to see how well do the teams adapt. There are three games for us today, with two extra ones played on Lion's Creed stream later today. They're playing two games against Espegade. So we're going to see how these teams play out coming into the playoffs with a lot of middle-of-the-pack teams still trying to find their footing, secure the playoff spots. Of course, Ben and Chris quite happy standing at 12-0, and zero, trying to continue the win streak for 42, interestingly has a higher win percentage against the top teams than the lower half of the pack. I mean, that much is true, but I was on the side of Venomcrest for their first game against 42 Gaming last week, and honestly, it was good from the side of 42 Gaming. They seemed to have a good identity 
when they're playing against these top teams to not play them in their strengths. Like we've seen them try to avoid the team fighting from Venom Crest, but their draft let them down slightly there. I don't know if Sazas has seen the matchup, but still, I think that Venom Crest, if we're going to talk about them too a little bit, their team fighting prowess is not a slouch whatsoever. Yeah, but we're going to have to see how the team fighting team of Venom Crest face off against the upset guys of 42 as we are going to head in the draft up pass it off to these guys on the cast desk as we head on to game one of today i'm looking forward to see what they're going to be picking for this draft because i've had the pleasure of casting for venom crest before and they are a scary team but last time i was back here on the nlc they were going against espergord and they were going they almost lost. They were so close, just teetering off there. But no, they still came out the victory. So Venom Crest are most likely to win this matchup already being 12-0. But I feel like 42 Gaming, with how they've been playing recently, this should be a close match. Well, it should be, but 42 Gaming, they've threatened Venom Crest in their first bout. So let's see if their turn bout will have something different. Already seeing the Maokai and, well, we've talked about everything that's changed, but we have, we have had some champions that haven't been touched. Something like the J, something like the Rumble that actually started to rise will be taken off. So it's looking like it might actually be an intriguing set of graphics here. I'm going to be curious if Rail got a big enough nerf where it is going to be banned away or it's going to stay open. Mostly because it can get flexed in the jungle and mid lane gets paired amazingly with the Rumble. And the Jays, which had still not been banned away. AD carry pool most likely just going to be the Zion and Kaiser coming out. Yeah, well, we're seeing here that Zier taking away from Dushka, but Wonski. Last time that he played against 4-2 Gaming, he was actually playing the Sejuani, and that is a very big, drastic change from what he usually likes to play. He said the Kendrid, he still gravitates towards the carries mostly. And we're seeing Venom Crest with these kind of bands. I'm expecting them to actually pick something that is pretty aggressive. Maybe we'll see a comp that wants to get in and engage, because that poppy pick suggests that they don't want anybody to peel them back off. Yeah, the meta kind of enjoys this now because of the tank supports coming in towards this bot lane. Kites again, first pick, Zaya in the second pick, 442. Usual expected. With the Kites, I'd love to actually see a Nautilus. I feel like with all the recent nerfs, Nautilus is just going so much higher in the meta. Yeah, but it will be their account, so the Lovebirds, as we call them, will be matching up. And Darrell is there, and the potential for flexibility is still open, especially with that third pick. And this is the crux of the draft here. Blue pick three, what will they reveal? They have to reveal either a mid laner, top laner, or a jungler. So picking the rail here, sure, she might be a quote unquote flex, but considering their next pick, she might already be logged into a role. I would be a big fan of Jace, only because it can get flexed between mid lane and top lane, giving them the little bit of flexibility. But instead, a jungler we don't actually see too much of the Lee Sin. And you talked about how Venom Crest want to play this early game hard, and their draft kind of shows it. Absolutely, a lot of engage, a lot of power. But we'll see. Now that they've shown at least one of their cards in the jungle, at least they've kept themselves safe in a term of not having to get counterpicked early on because now 4-2 gaming sure they'll get the, the start of the band but they'll get the fourth pick first so they will have to blind at least one of their solo laners but from here on out what do you expect for the last four bands on the draft that we have well both of these teams don't have any ap carries or anything really near except for maybe the kaiser so a lot of mid laners are going to be getting taken out the re victor is quite strong in the meta i'm interested about the lasandra we talked about because of how much cc they can really bring to a team and when you're something like the wukong or the rakan that wants to instantly engage and get out she can completely stop that absolutely and speaking of stopping things i was thinking that hey maybe something that we haven't talked about like this there could be an option but considering the fact that you picked the rel you picked the decent on one side and the other you picked the wukong i don't think that we're gonna see a lot of folk champions already we're seeing venom crest there just doubling down they don't want to be engaged upon they want to be the one that dictates the terms and they're just gonna take the orn away so no call of the force we got for the side of 42 game trying to take away these big tanks in the top lane. Sion is still an option for 42 if Venom Crest doesn't take it away because those two feel like they're the main tank, except for Cassante as well. So you can't really ban out everything as LeBlanc is going to be the last ban for 42 Gaming. Still thinking that it's strong enough after the static shifts nerfs and I kind of agree with them because if it was on Venom Crest team with the amount of engage they have, you add LeBlanc damage on top of that, it's game over for 42. Yeah, absolutely. Like, 
Venom Crest have a comp that can actually have the luxury of being a little bit elusive with a supercharge giving you invisibility. Was it a long just playing their tricks? But already Venom Crest, like, they've already decided to go for the Nar ban. So again, they're just strengthening that part. We want to dictate our terms, but maybe that Sandra with the scatter of the week with the big range playmaking potential that she has might actually be another tool that 42 Gaming can try to find early skirmish victories on. Most importantly, 42 wanted to have a defensive mid laner that can go against some of these aggressive mid laners that are still in the chapel. Nico could be uh, picked. It wouldn't actually be too bad for the team. You have the good engage from your rail, have Lee Sin. If it gets a good insect, could maybe get the Syndra into your team. And it is going to get picked up, meaning Syndra is going to have a little bit more trouble trying to push this out. As the last pick is hovering over that turn, not bad for the team again, because it does have the heavy CC that the team needs. And it's also great at being the last pick. And honestly, even that cannon might be a good option, but there's the best option, the premier Agreed. mid laner, top laner right now, Jace. Hopefully being logged in and it will be. And looking at that five man roster, but they've already secured a win. The LeBlanc is out, but you got the two best champions, both in the Kai'Sa and the Jace right now that haven't been touched. And sure, you have R5 and you might think, oh yeah, I, I have that counter pick option. But how do you counter pick a Jace in the top lane other than just picking a tank and survive? Welcome to Mal th that side. Welcome to Malphite, a champion that just sits there, doesn't really do much, tells Jace you can try and poke me. You're not gonna ever win and going to be a lot stronger in these late game team fights. Now, talking about late game team fights, the side of Venomcrest want to try and poke you out. They want to try and get to these objectives first. While on the opposite side of 42 Gaming, when you have a Malphite, if anybody doesn't know, you click that R button and it's called go. And then 42 Gaming are just trying to start this fight off before Venomcrest even know what's happening. I think 40 gaming's draft is pretty easy to execute, just as you said. Malphite is just gonna press go, Thornton is gonna follow up, and then you have caps just as well. You know, the Rakan has great engage, and it's even better as a follow up since you can weave yourself in and out of the team fight just by dashing back to that Zaya with the enhanced E range, and then timing your grand entrance to layer that CC. So I see a lot of big potential, I see a lot of big team fights on the side of 42 gaming. But as you said, Venom Crest with that big poke. Do for the, does even 4-2 Gaming have any chance unless they get the setup early on inside of the, inside of the objective part of space? I still think they can have an opportunity because they do have quite a bit of burst damage, especially because of the Syndra in the mid lane. If you pair that with the Wukong with the Cyclone, around this level 6 mark, they can try and one-shot this Nico before the fight even starts. But I still think the Venom Crest do take it, especially when they get into this late game, go for a 1-3-1, get these side lanes ahead. They can really pick apart 42. Yeah, absolutely. But before they do that, they have to get into the rift, get through the laning phase. And that is going to be something that will be pretty intriguing because we've seen a lot of Zyra Khan. And that combo, especially with the fact that 42 Gaming seems to want to play around level six. So that early to mid transition between like one item and two items, I think this is where 42 Gaming will try to flex their engage muscles a little bit. You also do need to remember that Rel did get a slight nerf this patch, meaning that Zyma Khan are going to be strong in this bot lane because this Rel just can't tank enough. So we'll have to see if the change is going to allow them to survive or going to die. Yeah, well, it looks like we are ready. So we'll be heading straight on to the rift for our first game of the day. Well, here we are. And Z Zastos looks like... Venom Crest are trying to go for something a little bit sneaky here, but the two teams are actually thinking of trying to exhaust an early fight or at least burn a summoner or two. And Thornton with a ghost and no flash on the Wukong. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Venom Crest trying to do something, especially when you have Rel and Jace that does have a lot of damage at the level one and a lot of CC for the team. But because they don't spot anyone out, they will put a ward into this bottom bush. And the importance of this is Touch now can reset, get himself the sweeper. So then the poke coming out from Zai is going to be very limited in this early game. Well, yeah, that's a great thing. But another thing that actually I think we want to touch on is I'm looking at Thornton and I'm not seeing a flash. And sure, like a, a part of me is like, you still have the Nimbus Strike, so you can still get there. But without a Flash, that Flash Cyclone option is pretty limited. So I think that Cut Light is the sole go button in that team. Everybody else has to follow up on the Malphite. But if the Malphite is not there, 
they may not have the best suite of options to get a pick onto Venom Crest. I'm just thinking more and more about Thornton taking this Ghost option because Ghost did actually get a slight change in this patch of going from 10 seconds to 15 but not having a reset after a kill. So maybe that will help out the Wukong, but overall I'm a lot bigger of a fan of this Flash because you can make those plays even without the Malphite there. Yeah, and they are trying to set themselves up here from inside of Venom Crest. Getting that early lead, trying to set a push on because you know that you want to crash the wave back into you by the time that Wukong gets there already. They know the placement of Thornton thanks to that ward and Thornton is electing to take a full clear. So things will be pretty stable for the time being. So if that's going to be the case, how do you fare these lanes going? Well, in the bot lane, it's going to be going Venom Crest way for this early game until I would say around about level six. Then this Ivor Khan is going to become lethal against Kennel if he's ever left alone. But in the mid lane, I'm expecting probably for it to go Nico's way until Syndra does have the first item where they will just be able to just farm out each other. Stay safe. And top lane, Jace is going to win. That champion is completely busted, I swear. I mean, he has not been touched and neither is Kaisong 1314. But speaking of touching, that's a great entrance. But touch one is a stun and already, sure, it's a very small victory. But 42 Gaming establishing a foothold in that bot lane. So I'm starting to think that they might try to transition that into a dragon, into a play, or maybe a pick onto Wonski or Malishka rotating into it. And you can see, like, Michael Pan me like Panda is just, like, having a lot of fun into Cutlight. And really, Cutlight doesn't have a lot of options. They just have to retreat, but they've been sunk off. Yeah, but take a look at Lee Sin. Olonsky hovering towards this top side may even look for a dive, but it is going to be quite hard. Me like Panda needs to hit some sort of, well, I'd say poke before they can go for this. Yeah, but they haven't. That's a shock blast out of order. Wonski right now, they're still going for it. Remember, the towers do absolutely hurt. So Wonski will jump away. It will be first blood, but it will be traded and Cutlight will get the flash in response. So I'd say sure. You lose the wave, but it's a pretty even trade. Otherwise, of that, like, 100 XP. That's bot lane. A little bit of damage coming out, but nothing too much of it. And overall, that is still a win for Venom Crest, because you'd much rather have damage on a Jace, sorry, a kill on the Jace, than something like a Malphite, because it just is able just to scale so much more better. And on top of that, because it was first kill, extra 100 gold over it means there's a 200 gold lead in his top lane. Yeah, it is a 200 gold lead. But the Malphite isn't out of the woods. Malphite's still very much in the game and will continue to stack armor. Up to the point that I believe there will come a point in this matchup where Malphite should start to neuter the Jace. But then I'm looking at the Syndra, I'm looking at the Zaya and the Recon. And none of them are going to be tanky enough, but I'm seeing Thord in there. Trying to go for a sneaky, cheeky lane gank. Yeah, trying to see if um, the bot lane of Alonsky wants to come down, try and find something, just in case. But because he noticed nothing was going to happen, goes for the quick reset, gets himself towards this top side, as Cutlight's trying to push out this wave, get himself a reset as well. Yeah, me like Panda is going to town, onto that Malphite. And with Alonsky actually doubling back towards the top lane, it might not be the best of times, because Cutlight, Cutlight has moved, there is a flash by Alonsky, but it will not connect, so... That's two flashes expanded in the top lane, and sure, they've gotten the kill, but it was not for free. Yeah, making sure that Touch isn't able to reset just as he wanted as Cutlight. In a bit of danger. Yeah. Ooh, in a lot of danger. They're trying to find it, but thankfully, Thornton is there right now. By the top side, and Cutlight will be able to get away with their lives. Yeah, the and... reason that Cutlight had to go for that was because he needed to push out this top wave to get a good reset, but because he was in an awkward state, he needed to stay for that slight bit longer. And because of all this fighting in the top side, Dragon is spawned, and no one seems to really be wanting to go for it. Yeah, it was a recall timing for both of the bot laners, but right now, with how everything has been going in the bot side, and especially with Wonski not having a flash and sword and still having their goats, maybe it will be an okay fight for 4-2 Gaming to take. But it will have to, we will just have to see who will get that first push on the bot side, who will be able to respond first. That's if even they want to go for it. Because if I'm Venom Crest and I have two scaling champions like the Jace, like the Kaisa, I might just give it away. It's just a camp tech. It doesn't really matter that much for the comp before 2 gaming. 
Yeah, and the way they're scaling is super well because there is a slight CS lead for Modelisco in the mid lane, but most importantly in the top lane, having themselves a 20 CS lead on me like Panda, showing the, the amount of pressure he's been having to have with the jung jungler being near him. Yeah, well, the junglers are both in the bottom side of the map, maybe trying to establish themselves a foundation into moving for that dragon, but neither of them moving for it just yet. And honestly, it just feels like, as you said, sure, like, Kalai isn't going to have a good time. But Kalai has been immovable, and this time it's Owonski's turn into a lane gank. Yeah, trying to go for a lane gank, but instead actually just making sure that the wave is going to be pushed out so they can look for the Drake. Yeah, and they're setting themselves up here. And do we even expect contests in 4 gaming in that spot? I think not. No, you can't expect it, mostly because of the wave in the bot lane getting pushed out, allowing Kennel and Touch to get first move. Because if they leave now, wave's going to be able to get frozen by Kennel and Touch. Yeah, but that's the big win for Venom Crest. They've definitely, stun they've definitely stunted a fact of any Dragon Soul being an early objective for the side of 4-2 Gaming. And we will have to wait for the next Dragon to spawn. You see, what will it be? What will be the soul? But for now, the game is back to a lull state, and that still benefits Venomcrest. It does benefit Venomcrest, but if we're thinking about these teams outside of the comps they are playing, Venomcrest by this point, most of the games I've watched them play are usually around about 2k gold up. So super impressive that 42 Gaming are able not to just withstand, but actually do quite well against the top team in the league. Well, absolutely. I think 42 Gaming's their biggest strength in my eyes is their early to mid transitions their skirmishes the way that they trade objectives just as you can see right now they've lost a dragon but they're taking the herald 314 and that means that they will have access to putting that gold and pumping it into either their ad carry or any of their solo laners and honestly i wouldn't expect it to go for gun line i wouldn't expect caps to go there but he is going that's gonna be a big route they'll force the rail away they're still doing a lot of damage but they're gonna expend the ultimate from the Kai'Sa, but no harm, no foul at the end of the day. All four bot laners staying alive. And it was because they were able to get level six first on the side of the Zion and Khans. They went for the fight instantly. Luckily, Kennel and Touch did just have enough tankiness to get themselves out. They did expend the ultimate from the Kai'Sa to escape there, and the Ghost of the Ignite coming out from the bot laners of 42. Yeah, and that summoner advantage is going to be something that we will have to see will they be able to utilize it because Owonski used that flash nonchalantly on the top side of the map and he hasn't been punished he hasn't been picked off and you gotta give it to the pathing of the the venom crest jungler there just taking their time knowing when to aggress where to aggress and then knowing when to back it off when you are not sure that you will actually guarantee your life yeah, super impressive, but 42 do actually bear some fruit from the play they made earlier. Been able to get a tower play onto this Zaya, a little bit more gold into their pocket. But one thing I'm going to be interested about is where they're going to be using this Rift Tail, because it has been up for almost half its lifespan. I'm expecting now this level 6 from Thorden to be making a play around this bot side, as we do know Kennel doesn't have the ultimate. Yeah, that's absolutely huge there, but Kennel still had a flash. And I'm not expecting it towards the top side, despite actually most of the deficit between 4-2 Gaming and Venom Crest being between Milok Panda and Cutlight with that 30 CS deficit. Or the advantage if you are a Venom Crest enjoyer, but for now, still haven't seen the Herald, still haven't seen the second dragon. What will it be? And everything is going pretty well for Venom Crest. They're even starting to garner leads both in the mid lane and in the bot lane with their summoner lead. Yeah, but it may not be for long, as we do see Wukong around this bot side. Oh, they're trying to go for it, but that's going to be an escape from touch. I don't think that they have enough to engage. Wolski, though, is there. That's going to be the Magnus Storm, a great stun, but Thornton has found the angle. They've both been rooted down, and Dutch is still alive. The smite is not enough, neither is the Cyclone. That's a great kick, that's a great stun, but still... The, the Nimbus will get that last kill, so it will be one for one to be traded. But Kennel there, stay with a flash, still trying to find an angle. We'll find that second ultimate pretty fresh, one auto attack away from dying. And it will be the lead to Venom Crest using that summoner lead that they've gotten in that level six trade and turning it into an advantage for the blue side.
Yeah, Venom Crest looking like it's going to end up bad for them, but a 2 for one in their favor. An incredible kick coming out from Alonski, and then an outplay from Kenno as well. But Caps may not be done. He may try and look for a kill here, but he doesn't have the damage. So instead, just going to hold this wave. But overall, great play coming out from Venom Crest. Yeah, absolutely. Them slowing down that fight enough and being able to bring Alonski into the picture and then Alonski with that insect, sure. It did push it into Touch's way with the extended range from the Wukong Q. But at the end of the day, they knew that Canal still had Flash. They pulled the trigger in that play. Despite it being slightly risky, they were able to outplay it. And from here on out, we've seen the static shift. As we said, it's nerfed. It will not one-shot the cannon casters. But it will still be enough to get a lot of lead and get a lot of shove for the side of Venom Crest. Yeah, on top of that, it does actually have a little bit of an increase on its attack speeds. The actual damage output coming from the Kaiser is actually going to be a little bit more, making it even stronger than before. But because of that big team fight that happened towards this bot side, Kennel and Touch will not have any summoners up for the next fight. Neither does Olonsky with the Flash, one of the side of 42 gaming, no Flash for this Zyre. So a lot of the carries don't have many escape tools left. Yeah, but still though, we haven't seen Kurosh's impact in anything that has happened for the entirety of the game. Neither way we've seen Cull Light. And I feel like that for the side of 4-2 Gaming, they've been neutered here and that's gonna be a second dragon. They might have to give away. At least they will try to regain some gold with that Herald being put down. But a dragon will go for the way of Venom Crest. And Venom Crest, despite getting the scaling team, they're still winning in terms of objectives. Yeah, 42 Gaming actually making sure they can't come around the easy way. Able to pick up two tower plates, but they might be in danger. Oh, the teleport is coming in. Everything in the kitchen thing has been thrown at this fight, and they will throw Thornton out of the rift. They're trying to find a damage. Kurosh is going to have a good impact, but they need to find a kill. That's a great insect. That's Zaya out of the fight. Now Owolski, still alive, still healing, will do a lot of damage, but they will trade one. Will it be consolation? It looks like it will be. Kurosh will finally be forced to flash, but it's a little bit too late. Mutlishka will still get that one in touch with a sliver of health. We'll stay alive. This game has turned into absolute chaos as it is going to be a one for four in favors of Venom Crest. And this is why they are the 12 L team. Doesn't matter if they're scaling, doesn't matter if they're the early game. If they fight, they win it. As the only player to survive is going to be the Ricardis. We're going to take a look at the replay to see what exactly happened in this fight. Because if we quickly take a look at the start, Touch finds that great engage. Great Q coming out for me like Panda. Bursts out the Wukong, meaning it's a four versus five. Alonsky on the back line, staying alive for just so long that he gets back onto Fruity Fresh. It kicks him back into the team. And from here on out, Venom Crest are just going absolutely wild on the enemy team. Great play coming out from Venom Crest to win this. And look at this one flash from Modliska. Oh, flashes over the dash Q to get themselves the last kill. Yeah, honestly, that was big, but my takeaway from this isn't just us staying alive on 10 points of health. It's actually the fact that for 2 Gaming, it, it felt like they were segregated, like a part of them, at least in my eyes, Kurosh and the Rakan were trying to stop the Lee Sin, but the rest of the team were trying to go for the Kai'Sa, and you can do that with a team that has one big burst of damage that you want to control it into a single environment. I feel like they've separated their damage a bit too much. That Wolski ended up being alive. The Zaya ended up being in danger. And now they're starting to flex their muscles. All of them have their first item completed outside of the realm. And they're starting, as you can see, Kuros is already pushed out of the lane. And things aren't even looking better for the jungler who will be brought down. So Thornton being caught off on the bot lane, flexing their muscles here. Yeah, Venom Crest are able just to keep pushing and pushing. They're even looking for Koro. Ooh, they're gonna get that one. That's gonna be the all. That's gonna be the kill. And that's an easy one for Canal. They're just farming up that cash. And now, despite 4 2 gaming, trading early on, they're falling to the wayside by now, Tatos. Yeah, being 5k gold behind, they are going to be getting a little bit of gold back in the spot lane by picking up the tower. But overall, Venom Crest, five minutes ago, we were saying how 42 were just being able to keep up, able to find their leads. But Venom Crest are completely shutting that down as they just keep pushing and pushing. Oh, that's another insect. They pushed them back and Owonski will get the last regard in that one. The final auto attack will come from the monk. And they're putting their eyes towards that top side. And honestly, with that cut light, 
who I feel like we haven't even seen the Malphite taking part in this game at all. Should be pretty hard for 4 2 Gaming to even have any response, and they're continuing to just try to farm up and scale up, but they're not gonna scale anywhere as hard as Venom Crest with both the Jays and the Kaiser. Completely agree with you there. And a great example of this is Cutlight. Somebody who has been able to farm up as a Malphite, but Venom Crest is so far in front. He just doesn't even feel like a tank at this point. If he goes in slightly too far for his team support, they can just burst him out before anything is going to happen. But we're going to have tier 42 gaming are going to be getting a few things back, trying to push out this mid lane. But I feel like the side of Venom Crest are going to be able to defend this. And it's going to be hard to try to get back in. Honestly, I feel like the only way that they can actually get an M back into this game is having Cutlight trying to start a fight, having it clean from start to finish. I still think that they have enough damage if they layer all of their damage at once. You get the Unstoppable Force, you get the Cyclone, and then you get Kurosh to lay in with the damage and Fruity Fresh to clean people up. That sounds like a recipe for success, but we haven't seen that whatsoever all game long. What we're seeing is Venom Crest eyeing for Kurosh, and I think the Kurosh has nowhere to go here. He doesn't even have flash up, so it needs to be careful. It will not land. But they have Ooh. created themselves space, taken away the whole entire jungle. Dragon is going to be spawning in the next 15 seconds. So instead, I think 42 are just going to look for this mid tower. Honestly, I don't even know if that's enough. They really need to win a team fight. They need these shutdowns, especially the one onto the Kai'Sa to have a way back into this matchup. But you can tell, Venomcrest doesn't even care about the objective. They want to go in. That's the real some mess. They're waiting for Cutlight, who will teleport. And actually, that's Kurosh. So they have all five of their members. And well, let the Dragon Dance begin. Yeah, Dragon Dance. They need to go for this. It's going to be soul point. Otherwise, everybody does have their flashes up and available. These carries are going to be hard to get onto. Oh, Wolski, wait, they missed the Unstoppable Force. Now they don't have anything else to engage with. And Modlishka with the picture perfect Nico ultimate. Everybody's going down. Canal has the freedom to walk in. You may call your blades, but Cutlight will be called to the dead. And so will you, Rudy Fresh. That is a clean fight there. Sure, it's a 5 for one so it's not a clean ace. A Venom Crest. They've absolutely decimated 4-2 Gaming there. I don't even think you can say that was Venom Crest. That was Mod Liska just coming up clutch, getting himself a five man ultimate. And because of that, they were able to get the tower in the mid lane, not picking up the inhibitor, instead looking for this bot tower. And Arthur is going to be looking for this Drake. A lot of standing gold right now into the inventories of Venom Crest, who are starting to expand their lead further and further. And you can look at this fight. Like, Just my one takeaway is like, look at Cutlight. Look at Cutlight. Where was that going? We don't talk about it, okay? But we do talk about what Mod Liska is about to do. Get straight into the back line. Five man ultimate. You don't see that very often. And that just shows how great these players are. Then afterwards, we have Kennel flashing in into three members. And look at this Void Seeker onto Fruity Fresh. Sniping him into the back line. The cut light all on his own. Just gets bursted out. What an incredible fight for Venom Crest. Honestly, you gotta give it to Venom Crest. They haven't allowed Tor2 Gaming to have a clean 5v5 fight. It's like they always have to expand one ultimate or one big summoner to even have a chance going back into this. But look at the damage. The poke is starting to pepper them down right now. And Canal, with that, Evolt Voice Seeker is taking people down and Kuros will go down. Oh, that was close. If Milak yeah. Panda landed that, that would have sniped Fruity Fresh for sure. That would have actually been really important for him because Carol does have quite a big bounty. I believe it should be about 500 gold. So that's 700 gold over to their pocket. But instead, because they weren't able to get the kill, the gold lead has almost gone up to 10k. And Venom Crest, only 20 minutes in, could just look for this Baron. Yeah, and now the suffocation is starting to be quite a bit of a problem for the side of 4-2 Gaming. They don't have any place to breathe. They don't, aren't even playing in their own jungle. And they're just being strangle held back into their base. They don't even have the right to get out of here. I love seeing Mod Lisko, what he's doing, because he's just using his clone, resetting from the enemy team, pretending to be Kaiser. And because of that, they are able to pick themselves up the Baron. And it's going to be hard for 42 to try and defend this. I'm expecting a 4 1 to be coming out from Venom Crest. Make sure to have this chase all on his own in one of these side lanes. The rest of the team just bow down one of these lanes. Starting to feel that maybe it's a little bit too late. 
Do they even have enough damage to have a good team fight? Like, if everything aligns, if the stars align, does 42 damage even have enough damage to kill Canal? I feel like they will have enough damage if they try and burst him out, mostly because of the Syndra. Does have that one and a half items, so it'll be a little bit stronger. Having that Dark Seal, not really being able to make much use of it. And an interesting thing we haven't talked about is he doesn't have boots. Well, that's going to be a problem because Kurosh there is almost caught out by Touch, but thankfully scattered a weak. Will scatter Touch out of there and get him back into the jungle where Venom Crest has been eating. And the snakes are twisting and turning, trying to find an avenue to finish this game. With the Baron buff, the siege will be problematic, especially with all the poke. But if they get one of these picks, it might be better for them. They will try to find a touch, though. We'll try to find one Thornton with an big Cyclone, but it might be too late. The Nico there will not get the best ultimate, but Kurosh has no input in this fight whatsoever. And you can tell which team has the gold lead, despite doing almost everything right. It ended up with Olski getting three kills there, and it was only the support falling down for Venomcrest. Yeah, they use all their burst damage to try and get one kill, but it's not going to matter if your base falls and they are going to be looking for the end, Venom Crest. Yeah, the next is going down. Looks like Kurosh will just try to find the Constellation Killer too, but will Venom Crest actually go for it? That's the big question. That's the takeaway. They will not be enough because they will get that kill and they will be up 13 to 0 right here in the NLC. And Venom Crest are looking absolutely menacing right now. What analysis do you want me to do? 10 minutes in, they're like 5k gold up, and the next thing you know, the game's over. Venom Crest, what a team, 13 and 0. They only have five games left until they can get that perfect record. And I haven't seen a team that I have more confidence in to get that than this. Honestly, the team five prowess is absolutely impeccable. You look at everything that is happening. I have to highlight Awonski this game. I think he's my MVP 100%. by far. The insect has been clean. The fact that he has the insight to know which angles to take and knowing that, hey, even in that bot fight, which I think that was the fight that absolutely flipped the game over and there was no chance for coming back with 4-2 gaming. He was calm despite Asyndra blowing all of her damage onto the Lee Sin. He was still calm enough to just walk in. You know, you just walk into the bush and you are the Zaya back and that's game over. You don't have any other damage source for 4-2 gaming. I'm going to be honest, for Alonsky, playing Lee Sin, when I was looking at the comp he was going into, it seemed a bit in, from my honest perspective. However, I'll put my hands up. Alonsky, you did an incredible job, but his team did an incredible job as well. Three winning lanes, Jace in the top lane, had it was just an absolute stunner coming out from Venom Crest. Absolutely. That was a great one. So now, we do have our next two games, so we'll be heading to a brief break, and I think game two is lion crest against anima we will have takeoff and jace so that's it for me and that though so thank you everybody for coming in here but stay tuned because game two will be coming right after this break
and welcome back over to Division 2 Invasion of the Mainstream. I'm once again Carvis and joined by two new casters for us. Takeoff and Jace will be coming in for Game 2. And we're going to spend a bit of time to break down that Game 1. But Venom Crest look very, very impressive against the what we used to call Kingslayers 42. Takeoff, what did you take out of that game? <laughs> well... Uh, I mean, it's just Venom Crest being Venom Crest. I mean, uh, Kino was absolutely insane on the Kaisa, played very well that game. It was uh, interesting to see 42 kind of keep up in some aspects, but as the, you know, the longer the game went, they started losing more and more control, and uh, Venom Crest really just didn't have any issues in the last couple fights. Yeah, and that was the first game Modlishka has had off of Azir since 13.13 .13 came out. <laughs> Literally the first one, only Azir until then. And Jace, uh, we've been seeing, even with the new patch, the same priority picks show up time and time again. What do you think about the meta that's been forming up for this new patch? I just think even with the, the new patch that can come in and all of the changes, teams are just going to default to what they've been playing. It's a standard practice. You see this across multiple esports, not even League of Legends. When you get practice, you have comfort picks, and comfort picks will often carry you through unfamiliar scenarios. So until the meta figures out, I think teams are just going to stick to these, you know, these B1 cases and try and play around these win conditions that they're just used to. Yeah, and for Ben and Chris, it's been working wonders just demolishing game after game sure they might have some suspect early game plays mid game plays every now and then but they always come out on top but for the next game we're moving from the top of the pack to more close to the bottom with anima currently 2 and 11 we've seen a bunch of strong early to mid games always falling flat near the end against uh lion's creed with only eight games played how do you think these two will match up take off you've been following anima quite a bit uh, it'll be interesting. It's always hard to tell if Anima will actually pick up the win on that day because, you know, as everybody knows, that's seen them play. They're really, really great in the early game. And for those first five, ten minutes, they're playing the game very well. But there's always one or two mistakes that happen outside of that. You know, sometimes they get a little greedy. Sometimes they just misplay. Uh, sometimes they're not making the right macro decisions. But there's always something that makes it to where they can't close out. So, it's always just a matter of uh, do I think they'll be able to close out in terms of teams that they can do it against. I mean, Lion's Creed, maybe. Maybe they could do it. Well, we'll get to see whether Lion's Creed can or not as we are going to head into draft for game two of today. Take off and Jace, take it away for us for game two. Here we go, game yeah. two. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. As we're going to be getting into draft in just a moment here. Jace... I don't know if you've been reading patch notes, uh, but we are on patch one or 13. I almost said 1.14. No, we are not in season <laughs> one. We are in season 13 and it is patch 13.14. Yeah, I think if you asked anyone, if you showed someone season one, you hopped in a time machine and you showed them <laughs> some of the passives even that we've got in season 13 now. Oh my God. They would be very scared. But instantly, I'm in your band the side of anima. And well, it's just obviously that that's going to be targeted. Carp is taken away as well. I actually like the side of Lion's Creed. Carthus is really good when you can just play triple AD topside, have your Carthus sit bot lane, can maybe even play jungle as well. You can flex the pick, and Carthus' solo AP is disgustingly good. Solo Q team environment. That Requiem R just does a ton of damage when it's the only AP on the team. Yeah, not only that, lots of places he can go. Jungle, obviously the most popular role for him right now, but ADC and mid, both certainly viable options for the Karthus, as Ash is gonna be the last ban. Blue one, lots of very solid options here, but I was gonna say Kai'Sa probably is gonna be what they go with, and that is what they do. Yeah, Kai'Sa, really flexible pick, could be played by Mill in the mid lane, where you can just sort of sit in Narnia and spam Ws, and with that Void Seeker, go full AP build, or you could play a more all in if the enemy draft short range for spiky for lion's creed uh adam are gonna look to probably respond with zaya potentially could be rakan could pick jungler here as well but zaya i just kind of looking to play disengage into a potential all-in comp that you could pick with zaya or with kaisa of course you've got the w spam that i mentioned as well so i think kaisa kind of has two modes right now Yep, and it's actually going to be the Sejuani that they pick up here. Going to maybe see if Lion's Creed want to take away the Rakan. Lots of very strong engage if they do manage to get the Rakan along with the Sejuani. But Lion's Creed, just going to think this one out. Maybe could look for some disengage options for support as well. And 
Instead, they go for a very hard engage with the rel. This is almost the same draft we saw last time so far, just Sejuani instead of the uh, Rakan. Yeah, teams seem willing to handshake stuff that they think is good. And um, being able to play out, I've said plenty practice rel is one of the stronger jungles on the patch, can also flex its support, but most important jungle. There we go, I think that's going to be instant Rakan lock for the support there. Yeah, into take. This is, yeah, kind of interesting seeing the set here, uh, you know, for Lion's Creed. Not that it's a, a bad pick set, certainly. Uh, I wouldn't say is the best or the worst kind of in the middle there, but not someone that I don't think I've seen Achilles play before. So it'll be interesting to see how he's able to pilot this one. I wonder where the set is going to go, because it, uh, my first instinct would be in the top lane, right? Take off, but yeah. set has popped up over the last couple of years also in like korea like lpl lck is sort of a anti-engage support so potentially there's a crazy flex going here for zuko in the bot lane to be like set support into the zyra card i'm not quite sure how that would work and how effective that would be but considering rakan really does like to go in you know you would think maybe that phase breaker into the uh i forget the name of the ult actually but the the settle might be a good way of really splitting that zaya type and maybe taking them even out of that rakan dash range that is of course extended when you have a zaya as your adc partner to dash to yeah uh we'll have to see where it goes uh, i i'm not the biggest fan of it going mid so i'm really hoping it goes top but uh we'll just have to see I actually should mention because i did say achille earlier is actually not the starting top laner today uh they do have zuix in the top lane as the substitute forgot to mention that earlier as fiora jack's gonna be the band surrounded out which makes me think even more that it is gonna be a set and h rocks who got a very generous buff this patch is gonna go in the top lane for Vince. Yeah, generous is an understatement. This uh, this dark in Juggernaut is once again one of the best top laners on the patch. Disgusting damage, you can go Lethality, you can go Bruiser, Steric Stage is great, Death Dance is great, Dust Blade is great. I've seen Buipo, Nihil, some of the best Aatroxes in EU West completely dominating in here, in EU, in Korea, on NA with this champ, Conqueror, whatever you want, Aatrox is oh. broken. Ooh, and Zeraf. speaking... Ooh. Yeah, Zerath. Yeah, speak speaking of champions that got buffed this patch, Capstock gonna be running the Zerath. Gonna have one additional missile per level on the ultimate now, so... That'll be interesting to see uh, in the mid lane between those two. Probably not going to be the most exciting, but it'll still be interesting how this matchup's going to go. Yeah, I think interesting to point out, Lion's Creed have, I don't want to say almost counterpicked themselves, but Zaya traditionally very disengaged, very sort of tight back kind of style of ADC. Um, Capstock has got a lot of range as well to be able to almost benefit off that and play alongside that and Lion's Creed have drafted what looks like pretty much full engage they're the most range on their comp is going to be Kaisa with those void seekers but apart from that Zuko going to be going in Emil and Panda on that classic Lissandra Viego comp that we've seen over the past couple of months and even year and of course Zurich's on the set he's only going to be wanting to grab the Aatrox and slam them into the back line as well so take off I think it's just a game of can Anima get ahead can they go even in lane or so and how are they going to deal with the massive amounts of CC that's going to be piled onto probably Capstock and Relentless like all of the time here those are the big targets for Lions Creed here in these team fights. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, if there's any comp to get ahead early on, this is the comp to do it. I mean, you have the Zion, the bot lane, Atrox in the top lane, lots of snowball potential in your side lanes. Like I said, mid lane probably going to be pretty boring, but you never know. Especially, like I said, an extra missile per level. Some people aren't used to that and they kind of get cheese, but here we go. Finally, getting into this game between Lions Creed and Anima. I am so excited to get this one started. And we're going to be going right into the rift with probably what will be just a standard five point start. Yeah, just stopping any invades, getting early vision. Andrew Los Viego will want to be proactive early. Sejuani likely going to try and go for some form of three camp into a side lane as well. I gotta admit though, I think this might be a very, very volatile and very important top lane matchup because if Vinze can get a head takeoff, I look at the five champions on the side of Lion's <laughs> Creed and I'm, you know, if even you're half good at Aatrox, I would say this is a monstrous game for the Darkened Blade in the top lane. Yeah, I mean, you, oh, you do okay. have some single target with the Lissandra ultimate, potentially could try to shut them down, but uh, I mean, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to deal with the Aatrox if he gets so fed. 
gonna be we'll so see so where that ends up going yeah yeah, and I mean, of uh, course, you, you've got Zaya that you want to play to in the bot lane as well. So potentially, if Adama offered himself too many win conditions, something that I've sort of uh, been discovering and seeing as a recurring pattern in the NLC, I believe it was, I forget which team, but they played uh, a very strong carry top. It was like a Gnar or a Aatrox top with uh, a Rally and Soul center bot lane. And the jungler for that team was just too stretched, tried to play towards both side lanes and end up sort of bleeding both of them at crucial points. So interested to see how and where Frost is trying to path for now. It looks like they're on a Raptor start. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, actually, it's kind of interesting to see Sejuani start on the Raptors, but, you know, with the W, probably pretty easy to do. And the top side, Aatrox actually going to be zoned away from the minions a little bit here by the set. Has to respect him. Bot side almost was able to get that ward, but it's just one auto left. That is always the worst when that happens. But look at this, a little bit of an engage here. Gonna actually be stopped by the realm now. Rakan was two autos away from taking a lot of damage, but nothing too big there. Yeah, Rel has been nerfed on this patch, uh, but she's still that CC, that mass amounts of being able to just overlay the CC effectively. When you have this much, you've got the W, you've got the Q, and then you've also got the R at level six as well. You're able to chain them together to create such a long chain. And even if the engage isn't perfect, it might work. And speaking of engage, Frost hovering here for a level two gank. Yeah, Frost wants to come here, does have the level three available. Uses the Q to close the distance. Zurich's trying to find a way to get out here, but I don't think he's going to be able to go anywhere. Does have the level three though, so is going to have both the E and the W for this fight. Second knockup's going to miss. Third one's going to land for Vince, but now he has to be careful because the fully charged W is ready to go, but he's out of range of it. Now Zuix oh does gosh. try to get the flash to get it, but it's just not close. The dash from the Aatrox is going to keep him safe, and first blood does go over to Frost. Yeah, first blood does over to Frost, but on the flip side, uh, I think Zuix plays that really well. By so much time that Viejo sees his top laner, Getting 1v2 to level 3 says, okay, but he did look in esports and he's just gonna cross map and take away all of Frost's bot side. Actually decides to just only take the blue buff and instead go for a bot dank. So we're gonna see Panda popping up in the bot lane any second now. Yeah. Doesn't seem like it went that well. Kind of just immediately, uh, no, uh, my bad, an immediate disengage from Anima's bot side. So gonna be going into River and with Frost coming down. Well, Panda did already get the Skull of Crab, so no shenanigans. Going to open up there for maybe a 3v3 in the bot side, but Frost, you think uh, Frost is going to be visiting this bot lane soon? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's also a win for Anima here in the early game. Panda, I thought, oh, for sure would have been able to take away Gromp or maybe even Wolves as well, at least get two of those three camps. Remember, Zuix uses Flash in that lane as well. The Aatrox is going to be hitting level four. That's an early power spike for him, of course, being able to put an extra point in that queue is effectively like putting an extra point in three spells. Assuming that you land them, of course, but level four, a decently big early power strike for that Aatrox. Got control of the wave, did have to burn his TP, but yeah, summoner advantage in the top lane. Of course, is likely uh, a good angle for Frost to be able to re top once he pushes out in a minute or two. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's going to be very hard for the set to lane against the Aatrox. Now, no flash, so it has to play very safe. Especially against the Sejuani, don't want to get locked down anywhere where you could don't have enough room to make the escape. But Panda now also going to the top side might be able to get a 2v2 there. But in this bot lane, just normal things that we always see with the Kaisa Zaya matchup. Zaya trying to push in the Kaisa, and Kaisa just waiting for the scaling to come in. Yeah, and scaling I think is the name of the game for Spikey here. As we see Frost sneak into the top bush, the potentially a top gank coming in. Frost has been so proactive in this early game, and Panda has only really taken a camp or two away in an invade, and that's about it. Zuix might just be running into a bear. Oh, here. first knockup, second knockup, third knockup. All three of them are able to land. Zuix has nowhere to go, no flash. So guess what? That's no life for you. They're gonna hand it over to Vince this time. Already Frost gonna start the recall. Actually, oh, hold on, wait a minute. There okay, we there we go. I was gonna say, I don't wanna call it too early because it did seem like maybe Zoix was cooking something there, but unfortunately nowhere to go. Ooh, Speaking of really Capstock, that's flash. the flash away. Really early flash from Capstock, but I guess was worried about the engage from Emil going into that frozen tomb to keep him locked up under tower. 
But Panda once again going for a gank and missing. Only up, what, two camps or so now. Take off from Frost once again, getting another gank, getting Liz Aatrox ahead. Interested to see what Vinze goes for on the back here. Expected a uh, serrated Dirk is going to be a Caulfield's Warhammer. So playing a bit safer for now. Not going to pick up that Dirk just yet, but still available on the table. Yeah, and as I start up that dragon, it does seem like maybe Lion's Creed want to take a look here, see if it's contestable, but I wouldn't expect them to really dedicate to this. It is just a cloud dragon, so probably just standing here to be annoying and making it a little slower for them. This early cloud dragon is going to go over to Anima. Next dragon, which you don't know what it's going to be, but we'll find out momentarily. And I'm, you know, I was just about to say, I'm really hoping it's an ocean soul. Because that is L that is going to be a really higher prioritized dragon for both these comps. As it might be, because that is a Hextech coming up. Hextech soul coming up. Uh, once again, Frost doing so well. Got the top gank on Zurich and then was able to clear down into the bot Drake using that prior as well. So big difference from both of these junglers early. Panda taking away the tier 3 raptors this would be from that Sejuani. Not dinged level 6 just yet. Neither of these junglers. Uh, hitting level 6. They're going to be close though, I assume, but Frost is just running top lane again. Probably going to do red cruds into top and I'm just looking for Lion Street takeoff. Like, what can Panda get done here? Because it's not like his lanes are bleeding and, you know, actively bleeding out, but it's sort of just a, a slow and painful death here for Lion Street in the early game. They're losing a lot. Jungler's not hovering. Zurix is down flash. Just got it back up soon here. Panda though is finally emerged in the top lane. Yep, and actually, he was able to get a kill on the Vince up there while we were watching that bot side. Maybe Frost's going to try to come over and do something, but instead he's just going to take some CS. But uh, yeah, this is, actually, they were able to get the kill, went over to Panda. So that'll be nice for him to have in his back pocket. But yeah, that, like you were saying, he is kind of uh, struggling to find the tempo that he wants, but... Now with that kill, probably just wants to wait a little bit, wait for some of his team to get some spikes in the mid game, and then that'll be where he really becomes yeah. a threat. Yeah, Herald is the target here, I think, for both of these teams. Zuix does have flash up, actually. Yeah. Panda traded his, but for a kill on Vinze. And considering that the first couple of levels, how they went for the set, to the side of Lion's Greed, still having flash for this Herald fight, still being pretty much up CS, probably even in XP as well. Actually up in XP, because Vinze just dinged level 7 there. It's not bad for the set in the top lane, doing well. Picked it early. Anima had the option oh. to counter pick, of course, but wait. In Look at lane. Panda here. Nice ultimate from Emil. Now they're going in, trying to find Capstock, trying to finish it off. He's so low. The Q missed, but thankfully, that is still a kill going over to Panda. Yeah, just missed out. Going to be traded for the Herald, but potentially should be a nice gold swing for Lion's Creed. 300 on the kill in mid lane, 300 on the kill in Herald split. And of course, plates are going to be up to. I thought this bot lane takeoff was actually going to be a bit more aggressive or linny, but both yeah. of these bot lanes seem more than happy to sort of just chill and lightly poke. I guess has been very minimum jungle presence there so far, but do you think this game goes a bit longer in both of these bot lanes store? Like, who, who do you favor in the next five, 10 minutes or so? <laughs> I'm... I mean, definitely Kaisa. Like that is Kaisa is the scaling champion. But we're gonna take a look at this top lane fight here. Top lane fight. Yeah, as I mean, it was actually a really good setup here by Zuix, able to get the Aatrox pinned against the wall. Panda comes in, finishes it off, and uh, yeah, very nice little two v one there. Actually, Panda now has two kills in his pocket, thanks to that mid gank that we saw earlier. So the Viego. Could snowball from here. We'll have to see. He's looking for the bot lane gank, but yeah, he's probably just going to recall. No real angle to really go in on, but Frost sees something else entirely. Now with it being a 3v2. Well, nope, never mind. Both jungle's not interested. No, Frost oh. is just going to be hovering, potentially predicting a Viego gank there. But Panda now going to likely the top side of the map. Frost had an opportunity, but yeah. I think it's just a case of the jungle tracking not quite being... 100% actually, I don't think Frost wants mm -hmm. to go for a play where Panda can perfectly fall up on a counter gank. His bot lane gets double killed, misses the chance to go for the Herald there, and just essentially bleeds over kills. But I think both these jungles not really needing, not really feeling like they need to force anything here. 
in the early game, both of them feeling quite confident. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Viego doesn't snowball as hard as he used to. Of course, was an absolute demon season 12 and season 11 on release, but still very, very strong, particularly with that Triforce. If this game goes, you know, past 25, 30 minutes, Viego are going to be able to accrue multiple items. These Triforce stacks, once the defensive items are up, Death Stance, more of Malmortius, whatever he needs, if he's able to grab it, Triforce will just deal all the damage Viego needs basically on its own. Incredibly strong, even still on 13.14. Yeah, and we'll have to see. Well, wait a minute. Maybe something going on here with Frost. They are spotted out, unfortunately, by the control word, but lots of people hovering for this dragon. He's panda spotted, I wonder. Emil gonna get the push in. Frost might be collapsed here. Oh, Frost in a lot of danger. Stun is able to find the mark, but it's able to hide just in time. But now look at this. Emil gonna be coming forward. Nice flash W there. Able to root two, and now Frost running for their life. I think he is fine, but uh, Zerith is throwing up some missiles, trying to find some damage, but none of them are finding the mark. Fantastic pick there from Lion's Creed. Now they're gonna get this dragon by even canceling the recall there. And yeah, it is Ocean Soul. So that is a very nice soul to have for both these teams. It's gonna be really interesting to see how they prioritize this dragon. Yeah, now gold lead in the favor of Lion's Creed after that fight. Lion's Creed, you know that their engage is telegraphed. It's not a case of if, it's when. Emil instantly goes in with that flashy R combo, manages to root two and put Frost in the glacial prison. Put them in the tombstone then. Capstock here. Looking under trouble, yeah. but Frost is there too. Trying to set something up. Quickness comes through. Nice knock up to follow. Emil could be dead here. Does fall down. Now they're trying to find more teleports being used by both top laners. The set trying to ult Frost into the tower, but it's not going to come through. Third knock up's going to find the spot. Yeah, Some sweet damage from the set there. Yeah, this is uh, an NLC classic. The ARAM in mid lane after 10 minutes. Both teams really trying to bot push. Of course, Anima wanting to drop this Herald. I think this will get charged. Uh, I'm not sure. Ooh, it does, it's already so low. Yeah, it's going to fall down. But oh, a follow-up fight might ensue. Zuko in a lot of trouble. That third Q did a lot. Oh. But now Zewix pulling them in, Thank trying you. to find an engage. But it's just not there. Panda just going to clear out the wave. And it looks like everyone's going to go back to their own thing. Bit of a tense moment there. Yeah, there was a Mexican standoff type in the mid lane wanting for that herald i thought it was going to charge and then the eye perfectly rotates into panda who's able to pop it for that big damage so a little bit of an overforce but hey turret plates were off in 30 seconds frost thought better late than never i believe relentless managed to pick up a sort of an even c in the cs there in that bot lane as uh spikey was on base but kaiser static shiv already relentless does have that kraken slayer built too but Honestly, the, the gold, yeah, pretty much even. It's about a mythic for solo laner versus non-mythic for top and mid on either side. And um, we're just going to see. I'm not quite sure when the next fight will come in. I would imagine it's going to be this um, this Herald that should be spawning in on just under a minute or so, I, I think. <laughs> I mean, with uh, I was going to say, with Zivix uh, maybe getting caught there, that might be our next fight. But he does flash over the wall, so he does get to safety. So, yeah, Herald might end up being the next fight is going to spawn here in a moment. But uh, Anima, not really in a state to contest it. They do want to get their bot lane back on the bottom side of the map, get some CS going. However, Zuko, well, was mid lane, going to go be going back bot side. Maybe a fight here in the jungle with Frost and Panda crossing paths. Top side does seem like Panda wants to gank there, spotted out by the control ward. And we already see people rotating. Vince coming down. Frost trying to cut him off, but Emil there for safety. And maybe we're going to have just another standoff here in the mid lane, but with Harold coming up, I mean, someone's going to have to pull the trigger. Yeah, I mean, Anima are looking to go five towards it. They push mid, sorry, they push bot into mid. So both Desire and the Rakan here. Lion's Creed basically send five to it with Vinze rotating down now. The mist is just going to scare them off for a moment, but there's no flank available for Anima, though. They have to walk back into the river against this hard engaged comp from Lion's Creed. Yeah, and I mean, this is just such a, weird, a, a dangerous spot for both these teams to be standing in. Panda getting close there, to maybe trying to find something, but Emil is getting poked down beyond belief by Capstock the Zareth. 
is doing so much work in that aspect, but speaking out, getting to land back some poke of their own, maybe finding something here. Panda just found the stun on the frost, but maybe it's gonna be frost that finds the pick, has to ult to safety over the wall. Zareth trying to find somebody with the ultimate. Decides to go on speed game with the last few shots. Doesn't land the last one. But look at this! Emil oh, from the okay. flank! Able to find Capstock. Now a fight's coming through. Nice there from the Zaya, but will it be enough? Zuwix able to find the W, but double kill now for Relentless. Vince gets the kill in the back on the speed game. And now Emil running for their life. It was a great engage, but now they're in danger as the frost is just gonna focus them get them down i mean there's nowhere for you to run emil you are as dead as they come and that's Bye, gonna emil. be the herald as well for anima oh wait baby hold on emil you can do it keep running do my route as well i think emil Please. don't think they have the execute timer just gonna go uh, gracefully uh. into the queue of capstock and I think the difference there with Capstock was actually able to force the Heartbreaker out from the Viego that denied the reset. Great engage from Emil, unfortunately. Anima just had all of their resources available. We're going to see in the replay, this is a flank coming in on the TP2, but the rest of Lion's Creed take off. They were just so forced out that Anima, all they had to do was just press Q from here. Look, Rakan R, Zaya R, Aatrox R, Sejuani R as well. All the resources. The set gets the W just at the last second. The true damage is dodged though, and... They can't do anything. Their engage is just completely whiffed and they fall over. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, nowhere to go and Anima punish them for it. Yeah, I mean, they were really desperate to finally engage there and it was a good engage, but yeah, like you said, they were just way too far up. All Anima had to do was stay calm and collected and they were able to find the fight. First Ocean Dragon going over to them, but the Herald actually might go over to Lion Crest. We'll see if Anima are gonna contest. Doesn't seem like they know it's happening or they just don't care. Either way, Lion's Creed are gonna be able to pick up the second Herald. Yeah, second Herald for second Drake is kind of an okay trade. I guess it's the third Drake to be fair, but you still got an opportunity. All of these towers very, very healthy. The top tier three has been pinged by Lion's Creed looking to break that open. Never mind, just gonna go and take it straight mid. I like it. They find the cross map and it looks like they're going to find a tower off it as well. So they lost this fight takeoff, but looking to still get more from it. Yeah, look at Vince here on the flank. Well, it did seem like he was going to maybe try to cook something up, but Lion Crest just not interested in walking very far up. Just take the Herald charge and leave. And now maybe Anima want to look for a return tower in the mid lane. They're keeping Zuix Relentless the there, but probably just to farm. Yeah, and all of these towers still for pretty much both teams uh so so healthy that was the first tower secure of the game it's going to be the yeah, important one in the mid lane but um i think there's just been so many fights so many hoverings around mid relentless and uh davindir as well going for that bot push into mid to try and rotate to contest that herald where that that first fight came that animal were able to really um win quite dominantly it was like a three to zero effectively might have even been a four for zero but there's just not really been time for these towers junglers have not really been present bot lane there's been no herald bot lane the first herald was waived second herald finally secures the tower but it's just been a lot of ping ponging waves back and forward and then a fight or two uh i really wonder how this uh benefits the lion's creed comps i think when i look at them there's definitely potential for them to fall off i think way harder you know once capstock gets items rabadon's void staff once relentless is able to you know build into What's going to be next on him, I wonder, actually. But Navori has been completed. Aatrox, the more items he gets, he's going to be a threat on the side lane too. Set, of course, falls off as well. I'm not going to say Lion's Creed are quite on a, time, on a timer takeoff, but they definitely get a lot weaker as this game goes on. Yeah, and we're taking a look at the gold here. I mean, the members of Anima, they, uh, they're only up by about 2k gold, but... Still, the people that they want the gold on, it is on those people. The Aatrox has a lot of gold. The Kaisa has a ton of gold. Got and, so much, actually. Yeah, if they want to play this slow scaling game, this is definitely the right track to be on. I am a bit worried about the Kaisa and how she's going to look the further this game goes, but see from them. Capstock using the ultimate from a safe distance to uh, just prevent the push there and get some damage onto a meal. Why not? But overall, just a very slow state game. As you said, it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, plays out for Lion's Creed in particular. Yeah. 
Yeah, Panda just trying to get rid of that ward. Needs that extra five gold or so. To be fair, I did talk about the the descaling almost of Lion's Street and how I think they definitely get a lot weaker. Spikey will not. Spikey's at two items in 20 minutes. He's going to be rushing towards yeah. probably the Ludens now, has very smartly left the option open to go Rage Blade and almost get a feel on some of these fights. It's a hotly contested topic right now, the Mythic for Zaya, sorry, the Mythic for Kaisa. But what is agreed is that you essentially go at third. You go um, Static Shiv into Nashes, and then depending on how the game is, Lyandries. Uh, Ludens or um, Jinsu's Rage Blade. Those are the three options. But um, two items for Tyser at 20 minutes. Going to have third item, that big three item power spike to get all the upgrades for Spikey for what is going to be either a Baron or a Soul Fight. Line Street have the late game win condition and it is Spikey. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, we've seen Kaisa's carry uh, harder comps to carry. This is uh, yeah. definitely a good comp to work with. If you are a Kaisa, you have a, you know the Frozen Tomb to help peel some of those high priority targets. You have Panda, who's going to be playing for those resets and the big tanky set in the front just to deter everybody. And that's not even talking about the rel, but overall, I haven't really had a chance to see the Kaisa really pop off in these fights. I haven't gotten a lot of fights in general. I think that last one was like the uh, the first big fight that we got. Yeah. And since then, it's just been all quiet. Yeah, it's been a lot of like hovering, a lot of stare downs, sort of mm -hmm. like this. Both of these teams really jostling for control of mid wave. Of course, that mid tower was forced open by the Herald. But once again, apart from that, like 23 minutes in the game and both side towers are still available. Oh. Vince, though, nice flash. Doesn't even hesitate for a second. This is TP in as well from Zuix. Remember, he's 03, only got the gold drink and I think just a core field's Warhammer, that set weak. But with that flash gone and the TP in, a panda, a panda and crew just going to start the Baron up? Surely not. Yeah, it looks like Lion Screen do want to do exactly that, trying to take the Baron. They think that the flash gone from the Aatrox, I, I guess that's enough for them to try and push this fight. I don't think they want to do the Baron necessarily. They just want Anima now to fight them with that summoner spell down. I mean... Yeah. We'll see. Aatrox doesn't, isn't, you know, the biggest worry when he doesn't have flash, but uh, look at Emil here. That's a very nice angle trying to find the engage. That's exactly what it does with Zuko. Going to be able to take up one kill on the Vince. Didn't have that flash. And as a result, maybe he does care about not having the flash. But nonetheless, second ocean dragon, third dragon for Anima has been picked up. Now it's soul point. They are going to start up this Baron, and I don't think there's going to be any way for Anima to contest it. So instead, they're just going to push the min bot wave. Zuko trying to come around here, trying to maybe set something up that they can do after the Baron. Goes ahead and remounts, but Anima just take their leave, and that is the Baron going over to Lion's Creed. So, sole point in exchange for Baron. I don't know. Do we think that's worth it? I'm not quite sure. I do like what Anima are trying to do. It looks like just in the, the jostle and the standoff that we have been seeing, uh, Relentless just said, okay, guys, I'm just going to go and get this secure Drake from free, uh, for free. Uh, Lion's Creed had no vision on it. They were all topside. There was no TPs coming, no wards for them to even TP on if they had those summoners available. And Relentless just takes that for free. But what Lion's Creed do is they recognize that the Zaya isn't in the fight. So, okay, where's their ADC? We're in a 5v4 situation. We've got numbers. We're just going to force. And they've got a great comp to force. That's what they did. They found the pick. And then they turned it into the Baron Vinze here. Does not want to get picked off. Just remember, Baron on the side of Lion's Creed. They're going to be looking to siege here really, really hard. And they absolutely have a comp to do it. Their Baron timer was so, so quick. They completely demolished that. And Kaiser looking to either go towards the Leandries or the Ludens here with that lost chapter purchase. I think it might be Leandries actually with that amp, uh, with that amp tome. Might be, yeah. Leandries might be the buy here. Wouldn't be bad. I've seen some people go uh, Crown of Shattered Queen as well against okay. like high pick comps. Maybe could be that as well. Probably not. Though. Probably is just going to be that Leandries trying to melt down that frost. Uh, then say just do annoying poke in general from afar. But uh... With Senjuani coming up here, maybe could look for a siege here in the top side. They do have four members, but I just don't know if they can dedicate too much to this. Now Anima's trying to match, trying to find something here. But yeah, this is just kind of a slow game so far.
just slowly sieging, slowly standing off in these uh, mid areas in the jungle. No one really wanting to pull the trigger. I mean, both these teams, they have to pull off these miracle runs if they want any chance to make playoffs. And you're seeing the tension here, just playing as slow yeah. as they can, trying to force the other team to make a mistake before they do. And that's kind of just been how all these fights have started. People getting picked, people caught out in these spots, but maybe something here. Look at that. Going to be able to find a nice snare now, trying to find more. Quickness able to find down one kill. It's going to go over to Vince. Oh my god, Zuko was blown up despite being able to get away. Emil trying to find Vince something him? in the back here, but stunned down by the Sejuani spike, trying to kite away, but it's just so much. Double kill now for the Zaya. Vince still chasing. The Aatrox is going off in this fight. Speak Maybe. Oh, actually, might have the Jukes, but I don't think you have anywhere to run, my friend. Shut down, going over to the Aatrox, and that's four down. Panda escaping with a sliver of health. That's really bad. I was wondering, there was a lot of posturing going on from both of these teams once again. Lion Street, I think they got a bit burnt by that first engage where they got completely obliterated on mid lane in that first big engage. Anima once again looking to turn a fight that Lion's Creed started to get rooted up under the tower here. Once again, the true damage W from Zuix does not go off. The set just gets burnt before that massive amount of damage can come in. It denies the reset away from Panda. He has to run for the hills. And Anima, yeah, they're getting CC'd up, but they're just so tanky. Relentless just being able to free hit from the back with those items as well. But Zaya is so, so strong, and Spikey is never winning this, no matter what Vinze builds. So low HP though. Look at this last Q3 damage here, by the way, onto Spikey. Bang. 493 <laughs> straight to the face. And the Zaya falls. Yeah, I mean, that is just so much damage coming out from the Aatrox. 4, 2, and 6 so far. I mean, this is exactly what uh, we were talking about when we first started the stream today and what we were talking about in the Champion Select. That Champion is just absolutely nuts. And... Yeah, won't won't be long lived. I think they already have a nerf lined oh, up for him, yeah, but uh, we're we're enjoying the uh, the Aatrox again while he's in the meta. Vince uh, has got the king and skin. This is the prestige DRX version. Um, yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous skin as well. So definitely pulling out a king and impression in game five. Um, unfortunately, looking like current T1 for the side of Lion's Creed <laughs> right yeah. now. Anima, though, yeah. very, very up in kills, actually did win this fight. They didn't really convert, but now they've got a great position for oh, Sol. Oh, this huge pick on the side here. We'll see if it goes out. Zemix able to hold him to the back, but he gets charmed so immediately. But it's able to disrupt the Zerath ultimate. Vince, so low on health, is going to be brought down by Suike. Now, Zewix chasing further. Blashy is not going to land, but look at this panda trying to catch up, trying to make something happen. Auto's going to be going down here. This is so bad for Anima. They were so ahead. Now they've been caught at an awful time. What could have been the Ocean Soul is now going to be a dragon for Lion Scree. And Anima managed to win the fight to, well, essentially punish the the captures, the mid lane tier two capture, but they weren't, they didn't convert anything else into it. It was essentially a flat 5v5 for this Drake and Anima were down in ultimates after having committed them in a fight only, what, 30, 40 seconds ago. This is a flank, I believe we're going to see Emil pop out of this bush any second now. There we go, perfect engage, and as well, finally, take off. Set W managed to come through. Look at this damage coming in from Zurich. There we go. Three, two, one, bang. 819, completely obliterated. Anima, and they can't do anything. Yeah, I mean, it was just so well played by Lion's Creed, playing that so patiently at such a great spot in that brush. Emil just in instantly kills the Kai, or sorry, the Zaya, and the fight was just so much easier for them from that point on. They really only had to worry about the Aatrox capstock. They able to get one ultimate in while Zuix was charmed, but now we're going to be going for the Baron, and Frost is on the wrong side of the map to contest this. I don't think they'd be able to either way, but second Baron now going to be going over to Lion's Creed unless some miracle happens. Now it's been taken. Frost trying to come in here. Trying to find something. We'll see if they can find an engage. They're running away, but Anima have not given up. Still taking chase, but they just don't go in. Not able to find anyone. Not confident on their ability, so they're just going to clear out mid instead. I think now, uh, with how slow this game is going, it is starting to slowly favor 
uh, Lion's Crest, if they are able to keep getting those picks onto Relentless, these fights are going to be very nice for them. Yeah, and the, the power is slowly starting to be built up for Lion's Creed as well. Leandri's online for Spikey, Rabadon secured for a meal, and obviously not quite the, you know, the one-shot scaling mages that you can see in the late game, like a Vigar or something like Capstock as well, once they get that Void Staff down. But Emil's damage is going to be so, so good on the engage. They are going to be able to blow someone up, like a Relentless, like a Capstock, or maybe even a Vinze before they can activate that World Ender to give themselves the increased Omni Vamp and healing. And I talked about the, the set pick, and I wasn't really a fan of it, and it's been looking weak in this game so far. The fight, he's not able to get that true damage off through, which has been melted in a lot of them. But finally, it's able to go down. It was just so much true damage that Lion's Creed, they were able to just find the, the damage break point, I guess. They just had too much damage to throw at Anima, even though their comp is designed to punish these engages by Lion's Creed. Being able to go first, being almost having that quote-unquote tempo advantage is so good. Because whilst your comp from Anima is designed to, as I said, punish that engage, if Lion's Creed find one good enough, it doesn't matter if you can use the tools to punish that engage. If you can find a pick, then you're down 5v4. Lion's Creed get to go again. They've got resets. They've got Void Seekers in this mid fight as well. They've got true damage to come in from Zuix, who doesn't need to be 10 and 0 to be able to do 900 true damage to either of your carries. So take off Lion's Creed. They managed to find themselves up in gold lead here, down in kills. And I think most importantly, when their engages have been good, they've been very, very good, and they've been able to get a lot off them. Two Barons, two Drakes. And from there, it's put Anima in a very precarious position as their waves are being actively pushed back into their own base. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Whenever they're able to fight on their conditions, they've been fighting so well. And now the past couple fights, they've been able to do exactly that, and it's paying off, like you said, second Baron of the game for them now, able to delay this Ocean Soul. I'll we'll have to see a minute and 30 seconds until another soul point comes up for Anima. Would be very nice of, for them to get that, especially for the Aatrox, but oh my gosh, the sieging is just so good. But look at this, they're looking for something. Emil using the ultimate on themselves to just try and escape with their lives, and that's exactly what's going to happen. But now they're really just good. Look at this, into the back. Zuix able to disrupt everything. Aatrox, oh, so look at this though. Vince is starting to pop off. Able to not land the second cube, but the third cube is going to find the spot. Able to get a reset on the ultimate, still chasing, trying to find Zuko. It was so good for Alliance Creed at first, but the Aatrox suddenly started coming in and started doing work. Now trying to find another one. Zuko able to get away, but still two for two. Anima able to prevent any sort of game end for now. 38 seconds till the dragon comes up. They're going to reset and probably contest it. And no TP up for Zuik, so that means they probably have to run straight for it. Anima, though, giving themselves a position to try and secure this Ocean Soul. Three Drakes, one more is all they need. 23 seconds left and counting Spikey. Gonna be going back to base for another Blasting Wand. And Anima are just gonna run straight for the Drake. Have them looking at resources quickly. No ultimate on Tapstock, no ultimate on Relentless. Don't think he's gonna have that for the fight as well. Has just respawned too, so Anima. I think they're actually going to be first to this Drake, just barely though. Tapstock is going to be fine joining this fight late because of their range advantage. He's going to have to try and get Relentless in, but both of these teams, both of these front lines in particular, just sort of here, basically in time, it looks like we're probably just going to get another 5v5 for this very, very important Drake. Yeah, and now the Drake is up. All 10 members of both teams in the general area. Oh, all over all. And it looks like Anima are going to be one to start it up. Zuko maybe going for the flank here, but Zubik's going to be walking straight forward. Panda sitting in the mist, trying to find something. 3k health now. Engage tools being used by everybody. As now the Zaya trying to continue. It's too much. But lucky Vince in the back here, trying to make something happen, trying to survive, but it's just not enough. Oh Triple kill for Zuix. That W Haymaker damage was insane. Now Frost trying to run for the hills, trying to run for their life. This might be the end of the game. This is not good. Panda trying to secure the kill here. W not gonna land. Smite and the Q comes through. Trying to continue to chase Frost might be in trouble here, and they do go down. Is that the game? Ace for Lion's Creed. They're gonna look to end. I think they might be able to. The wave isn't the best, but their tower damage should be good. What a haymaker from Zurich. 
has been crushed, has been put down all game, but they did not manage to burst him out, and that true damage managed to find them all with it. It was disgustingly good. Zurich ends that fight with a 4k, 3k at the minimum. Remember, started this game 0-3, 0-4. We're going to get the replay for it. And this was the danger for Anima, that they just didn't manage to avoid it. They're all perfectly in. The charm onto Zurich here, but I think it's a... Uh, face breaker into a W. Here we go. Look at this damage, by the way. Oh, <laughs> point, oh, 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 oh. Okay. Oh my, that is one of the biggest set Ws I have seen in a long, long time. Zurich, man, just so take off your like solo win for that fight. Holy. Yeah, that was insane from Zuix. The emergency sub was struggling at first, but then the last two fights was absolutely insane. And like you said, that last one, that was like a 3k damage at least on the W for the set. That was insane. Instantly deleted two members off the board. And from there, I mean, he just made the game so easy for his team. Absolutely. It was... I didn't think it was going to be the fight to actually end the game, to be fair. Take off, I thought was there was potential, but hey, when you get completely squad wiped like that, Lions Creed found the engage, going to be moving up now to three and seven in the record. It's two and twelve for Anima. I like the comp that they played. Unfortunately, as I said, Lion Lions Creed, they just found too many engages. The fight that they won, they managed to get so much more than Anima were able to get i think mvp of the game i'd probably give it to emil to be fair found so many oh, games yeah. to get their team going even though zurich was mvp in that last fight for sure we are going to be going over to a break now we've got game three of nlc division two coming right up thank you guys so much this was a banger of a game for sure and uh, don't go anywhere more nlc division two coming up right after this short break
Hello and welcome back once more for the last time today to Division 2 Invasion of the Mainstream. I am once again Carvis and this time I'm on the caster desk along with Black Block, so it's getting a bit familiar with us two. Unfortunately for you, you have to put up with me quite often at this point. <laughs> Never getting rid of you, am I? Just... Never. Oh, at least we are eventually going to get rid of this scene where we don't have the draft because we have a game of blue white against anima coming up anima dealt a brutal loss once again in similar fashion to previous games yes. while blue whites are bringing in an emergency substitute in the jungler Piki will be joining the team yeah, we've seen Peaky once before, came in subbed for the mid lane, which is where he's supposed to be, but this time around there's no jungler. So instead, Peaky just gonna come in, have a little bit of a role swap. We haven't really seen Peaky in the jungle, sort of, um, at all, actually. <laughs> there's no other way to put that one. Peaky just doesn't play in the jungle. However, Blue Whites, you know, they're not exactly up against the uh, stiffest of competition. Anima, they put up a really good fight in that previous game versus Lion's Creed, but... You could just see why this team is our pretty much bottom team of the league, why they're set in 10th place. They can't play the team fights as well as their oppositions at the moment. So if Blue Whites are going to have a chance to win with a subbed in jungler, this is definitely a pretty good option for them. But still, Blue Whites need to play as good as they can because Anima, they're no slouches. Anima, definitely no slouches. We've seen them time and time again, even challenging the best teams in the league, including Venom Crest. But with Blue Whites, they are pretty much the opposite of Anima, excelling in the late game macro, playing around MKR, while Anima are just going to aggressively push each and every single advantage they can keep their hands on, and usually that comes from Frost, roaming around the map with the rest of the team trying to accrue gold for every single member. If you have a substitute jungler, how can you deal with that? Yeah, exactly. Frost had a really good early game on the Sejuani last time around. Was able to roam around constantly, find a good lot of ganks, and really set up the early game to be in Anima's favor. It was the late game team fights that really let them down, so Blue Whites need to be careful to not get run through in the early stages of the game. As we jump on into these bands, we're going to see just a couple of standard bands right here, and I'm really interested to see if Blue Whites decide to take away anything that Anima had some good success on last time around. That Aatrox, I know that you guys highlighted it, or that Sejuani that we just said Frost had a good early game on it, gonna take that one off of the board, and that's one of those two sort of premier junglers at the moment. The Maokai, the Sejuani, those have been the main ones. However, on 13.4, not sure how much we're gonna see of that Maokai anymore. It does get banned um, away though, okay. That's most of the simple junglers now gone hmm. that are in the meta. We've seen Blue White's favor these uh, utility type junglers like Poppy, like Sejuani, like Maokai quite a bit, but with these target bans, targeting the jungle and mid lane heavily, it leaves things like the Kai'Sa open. We have seen a response with Zaya before. Are we gonna go that direction or maybe get something spicy ever around this? You've got that Zyra Khan still up and available. It's one of those better bot lanes that we have in the meta at the moment. You've also got a couple of those higher powered picks we've seen around gonna say like that Aatrox but the Ash being hovered in here Ash Brom's been popping up more and more it just gives you so much CC down in the bot lane it's pretty safe as well Rel oh. is one of those premier supports you know you can just jump in grab everybody into that magnet storm we'll see what's going to be paired up with right now you tend to want quite an aggressive early game jungler it can go quite well with the Zaya as well yeah and this also plays decently well with the Ash of course uh not getting the extra mobility and all that but having something to follow up on the magnet storm crash down combination is very valuable and they do decide to lock it in the ash is such a key win condition against the mobile targets in the late game like the kaisan and mumu getting locked mumu in support? i don't think so i honestly think this is just Pick as simple of a jungler as you can for Piki, but this one, not simple and flexible. Homo and my cash can both pick that one up nice and easily. Gonna have a lot of flexibility as well because you don't have that final pick as blue whites over on that blue side. Having that flexibility just inbuilt in your draft can be really helpful. And Jace, he's pretty great into a lot of the top laners we see at the moment. A lot of melee tops just can't deal with the fact that he's range got a lot of poke as well. And when you pair that up with a, with a Kaiser, that poke is absolutely huge. Galio, though, if it is going to be that, Jace can just absorb the pressure and works really well with an immobile carry like an Ash because you can jump in and save her. 
but this is also a cap stock specialty. Mm. We're, we've always talked about what pocket picks do people have? What do they like to play in solo queue if out, outside the competitive environment? And cap stock has been one to bring this pocket Galio out multiple times in the NLC Division 2 games. Uh, against the Jays, it may not match up well, but with a rail to follow up onto, mm -hmm. it could That's be amazing. Easy. Yeah, you can just jump into the back line so very easily. And that is one of the issues sometimes with Galio, because that hero's entrance can take a while to come down. You know, you need to be quite far into the back line to make it work if the opposition is retreating or something like an Ashley can leap in, try to save her, do your best there. It's going to be a couple of top lane bans coming out from Anima. Blue White is going to focus a little bit more onto the jungle pool. At this point, the jungle pool is pretty well curtailed. You know, there's not a whole lot of junglers left open for Anima to pick up. It makes a special sense with Peaky having that potential Amumu. It could be moved around to the support role, but like you said, it could just be a nice and simple supportive jungler in that role. Still a couple of those big high powered picks left that Jarvin has been hovered. That's one of those junglers at the moment that could get into the back line really easily and try to shut somebody down. That's a Camille though. Camille into Jace is a pretty skill-based matchup. You know, Jace has a good time poking out the Camille early on, but once you hit that level six, you can lock him down. Definitely swings in the favor of Vinzi. We know that Vinzi likes to be the carry on the team. Picks up the Aatrox and did pretty well on it last time around. And because of the flexibility of the Jace, you're gonna take the Renekton instead. And this makes perfect sense why we get a red side Jax ban. Normally you would look at that and go, why would they ban Jax? That's normally a counter pick. But yeah. of course, if you're going to blind Camille, then you're going to get rid of the hardest counters. Renekton, however, is still doing quite well in that matchup and is a high priority top laner. With the jungle being saved, the last pick we could see Velvet show up on the rift. And this is a champion that can take over the game. What do you have to lose as Anima right here? You've got yourself a very aggressive composition that scales decently well into the late game, but wants to get things going early on. Well, there fits that mark incredibly well. Once you can get that first kill, get that initial coral and just start running through the map, that is where this champion could really come online. We know that Frost can play the early game really well and transition that into a decent mid to late game. So Anima really going in on this full composition. You know, this is a draft that just wants to go in, 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 has plenty of combos to be able to do that. Whereas you're versus a blue rights composition that I'd say just wants to poke you out from range and then just go all in as soon as you've got people down to about half health. And the thing about Animus composition is that this comp can play from literally anywhere. Mm. And the key thing, they have strong early to mid game skirmishing power. They don't wait to scale with anything else than the Belveth. Well, they can, of course, Camille and Ash will scale eventually but they can take the early skirmishes and try to force the advantage with a Herald early on for the Belveth. And this is now all on Biki to find the skirmishes as the emergency starts to jungler. It's a very a rough situation to be in. Yeah, a ton of pressure putting on to him. It's quite a difficult situation to be in. And furthermore, you know, that Amumu really likes to gank, wants to find some early aggressive plays. However, Jace should be pushing in this Galio. Up in the top lane, it's a lot of fighting back and forth, but early on, the Renekton should be beating out the Camille as well. And in the bot lane, you know, you're not really expecting to get too pushed in by the Ash because of the threat of all in coming out of that Kaiser Nautilus composition is always there. So which lane is really being opened up for ganks? If all of your lanes are winning, it doesn't really allow you good gank opportunities as this Amumu. Peaky definitely not put in the best position to succeed, but we'll have to see what he can do on this fill role. We're going to see how Blue White approaches it as we head into the final game of the day with Blue White trying to tie themselves up with 42 as we get a very of scenic course. pause. And Anima, they might be locked into last place, but they can still affect the standings. And again, tried and true, they love to go in and go in, they do. Exactly. And like you said, affecting the standings is the main name of the game right here for Anima. They are sat right at the bottom of the standings. Even if they win their final three games, they're still not going to make it out of even the relegations point. So that's unfortunate for Anima, but Blue White's absolutely still in the scrap, want to keep themselves out of the relegation positions, but more than that, are still right on the edge of being able to move up into that top six to go on to the playoffs. Blue White's really need to win this one, and losing to Anima right here would put them in such a bad position. 
yeah, looks like we are having some issues with possibly the server will get an update. Uh, okay, yep. Guessing correctly, some <laughs> experience coming in handy. We will be remaking the game. So we have a small delay here. We, of course, same champion, same room, same everything. But with this composition now being put on the table, if we turn off the player names, okay. who would you give the advantage to? I really like the synergy that's coming out from this anima composition, you know? If we're removing the nameplates, because the name anima at this point in Div 2 makes you, you know, question things just a little bit. If we just took a look at this red side draft, I really like the synergy. We always talk about the Camille Gallio. You know, you lock somebody down in that Hotchtuck ultimatum, and then all of a sudden, what is a difficult hero's entrance to land out of the Gallio is pretty much guaranteed. And you can do that onto anybody. Say a really mobile carry, you know, that's pretty hard to pin down. Like, uh, oh, you know, like the Kaiser, who constantly is able to give you the slip and get away. All of a sudden, you're able to lock that down, just blow them up. It's going to make the composition much, much harder to be able to play for this blue side. And like we've been saying as well, the blue side composition, it just doesn't have that same amount of gank potential. And you really need constant all-ins out of this composition to make it work. And if you're not landing that poke before you go for that all-in, I don't know if that just 100 front-to-back composition works quite as well out of blue-whites. Yeah, Blue Whites has to play with the lane matchups, while, of course, Lion's Creed is heavily invested into the full-on team fighting power, with Capstock's Galio being the main force behind it after the level 6 mark. Blue Whites can still fight back with the proper matchups. As you said in the draft, Renekton pairs up well against Camilla, especially in the early game. Mm. If you approach too close, Call the Meat can destroy a health bar with full rage. Uh, there's also the Jace that is able to deal with the Galio, at least should be able to. Capstock, of course, having plenty of experience with the matchups. And bot side, you have the Kai'Sa, who is one of the higher scaling champions, has a ton of insane power spikes, and most importantly, can still utilize Static Shiv, even with all the nerfs. Mm. Still pretty good. Yeah, it's still definitely gonna hurt. Interested to see what that build was when we were jumping on into the game. I didn't quite manage to see what the rune choice was out of MKR. Did you see if it was the Hail of Blades or not? Okay, uh... we'll have to check that once we jump in. <laughs> if it is the Hail of Blades, then we will still be expecting it to be that static shift build, the more AP-focused build. Yep. Hail of Blades. Okay, so it is going to be that more AP-focused build, like you said. And so, yeah, there's a lot of pressure that's going to be onto MKR and Boltox down here because this is the lane specifically that has a lot of that innate power built into it you know if you can land that hook on the nautilus and just go all in 100 to zero pat damage is absolutely there it is 100 percent in the hands of blue whites bot lane to be able to find that early aggression but the rest of the lanes you know whilst they are in a decent spot you know if you get solo killed as a camille versus renekton you probably didn't play your hook shot correctly you know you should still be able to wall dive away from the renekton and sure lose out on a bit of cs but not necessarily get killed and Galio too, getting poked down constantly by the Jace, but not necessarily dying to those ganks. Sorry, dying to that lane pressure without potential ganks. And so this bot lane really is where I need to see Blue Whites step it up. At the same time though, Blue Whites' drafts have been certifiable iffy occasionally during the course of this tournament. And I don't think that this is one of these drafts. It has a lot of strong potential lanes. And that's something that Blue Whites have oftentimes lacked. Individual lanes being able to win because losing across all three lanes is absolutely a recipe for disaster. And that's not what's happening here. Well, let's try this again with the teams back on the rift. We'll see if Blue Whites can utilize their more powerful lanes than usual to secure themselves at tied spot with 42 in the middle of the pack. Or can Anima still affect the roster's lock in last place? Last game of the day, Blue White against Anima. Alrighty, plenty to play for right here. Blue Whites, they need to pick up this win if they want any hope of getting into the playoffs. Anima, pretty much locked out, but still looking to play spoilers. Coming oh. off of what was a decent performance, you know, versus Lions Creed, not quite able to pick up that win, but still in fighting form, nice and warmed up. So both of these teams are going to start pretty much just five point starts. Nothing going to get too interesting for the beginnings of this game. And let's focus in onto Peaky. Subbed in onto the Amumu. It's a pretty standard jungler to play. Not too much in terms of skill mechanics. You land those bandage tosses and you should be okay. Uh, you should be okay if you remember the bite of jungle. Adam. We almost had a small incident there. Had the recall early it's from fine. the five point. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Still, uh, just calm the nerves. You're subbing in. 
There's a ton of pressure on you. You're the main engage of the team along with the death charge. But still, Biki has competitive experience, has been a high level player. He should be able to overcome at least some of the difficulties facing this situation. However, Frost should be feeling extremely comfortable on this battle. Absolutely. Belveth is the kind of champion that you should only pick into a matchup you're pretty confident into or into another champion you know you're going to be okay with. Belveth clears the jungle relatively quickly, but is pretty weak during the early stages of the game until you manage to get yourself that first coral, that first little bit of a transformation, at which point this champion can really come online. But you are forced into playing around these big objectives, into the Drake, into the Herald, and your opposition knows this. So blue White, they need to be around these objectives, setting up good vision to be able to spot out what Frost is trying to do. And at the same time, Anima, they need to get Frost into these objectives and make sure that they are picked up by Anima. Otherwise, this jungler, Belveth, is really risky and can fall quite far behind. Already, you can see this vision spotting out Frost, making sure that everybody on blue White knows where this high-powered jungler is starting. Still gonna be some time until the Belveth turns high power, but with this ward, they spot out a possible early gank up to the top side you see frost lurking there my cash hasn't been able to crash in this wave yet and with the amumu clearing the entirety of the bot side will get spotted out by the raptor no it's barely out of vision frost is most likely able to steal out this blue buff but now there's a nectin coming in the amumu oh. gets spotted out this could be uh -oh. Trouble oh. for Frost, smiting it away. Beaky gets it, lands the bandage Bumble. toss. Frost now getting completely collapsed on. Easy first blood for the mid laner of Blue Whites. Oh, that one is overconfidence to the supreme. You can understand the idea from Frost, you know. You know that Peaky has started down towards the bottom side of the map, but the full collapse comes through, and this is just something you can't do as a Belveth versus these lanes. We've highlighted it. Your Renekton is going to be pushing in onto the Camille. The same thing is happening with the range versus melee matchup of a Jace into Galio. And so, of course, Blue Whites is going to be able to rotate to that play faster. That's exactly what ends up happening. And Frost gets put even further behind. Doesn't even pick up the smite onto that blue buff to be in a slightly stronger position in that 1v3. Goes down regardless. Things, you know, not feeling as good of a start as Animal would have liked. Yeah, it, this is the problem with trying to punish the enemy jungler for bad pathing if your lanes don't have good matchups. The rotation tempo advantage that you get from just shoving in a wave just way too valuable, and we get to see this again as Frost trying to smite away this blue buff. Doesn't have his smite have up! Smite. That yep. was the Doesn't problem there. Even if Frost had been able to get that smite, still would have been a kill going down. My cash was roaming over, as you could see, Pomo too. And the fact that Pomo managed to get himself a first blood is huge, because you're already in a winning matchup versus this Galio. Should be able to push him in, constantly poke out, and rotate to these plays faster. So on this next base that Pomo is able to get, we'll be coming back with a huge item advantage over Capsock. And because of the push as well that Pomo had, was able to shove that wave in and rotate down and not lose out on CS is still dead even with Capsock. So feeling very good at the start of this game. Frost has just got to limp back into the jungle, try to pick up whatever scraps are left open. And that's got to be a nice little bit of wind into Peaky's sails. You know, you're in a difficult matchup, just subbed in and managed to get your team that first blood. It's got to feel good. Has to feel good, and more importantly, stabilize the jungle. He doesn't really have to do anything anymore with these strong lanes. However, bot side, we could see a small engage here as Sovendur crash down, gets wow. cancelled by Boltox, but still no mana on this Kaiser. Has Peaky's to take here. a long fight. Peaky gets spotted out by the ward. Sovendur still has his flash, but is a little bit slow, finally able to get on the horse and gallop out of there. But top side. We could have another similar type of situation with the bush ambush. Level 6 hit by my cash. Needs to be a little bit careful. No level 6 yet for Vinze, but should be getting it at any moment. Dominus available, but against the Belveth and uh, Camille. I wonder if that's enough. I, I, I want to give this over to you, but the situation is so volatile that my cash just, just get reading it. for this. Just they're, they're waiting for the level 6. Now Vinze has it. Instantly he backs knows. off. My cash. He knows something's up, but he doesn't know what's up right now. Otherwise, my cash would have gone flying in. Frost, I here? think if we swap back over, we'll have gone back to base. 
at this point. Otherwise, we'll have missed far too much. Yeah, had to go back to base at that point. And really good tempering of aggression out of my cash because he knew something was up. As soon as the Renekton hits level six, a good half a wave before Vinze was going to get it, you'd expect that to be a all in. Instead, my cash just continues to take the minions. You know, goes in a little bit with the slice and dice, but not all the way. Frost, tempting a gank onto bot lane. Boltox, still pretty tanky though, even at this early stage. Just gonna be able to walk under the bush. Frost, not having the best early game at all. Wasted a lot of time in the top lane. Now has gone for a gank bot lane that doesn't work out. The strike is available. It's only a cloud still, though. You definitely want it as this Belveth, and you can see Peaky knows this, making his way down towards bot side as well, as are both the mid laners hovering around. If anybody decides to go for this drake, there are going to be many friends in the area. Look what sees the Ash Arella pair recall, trying to get themselves to small. But with power spike top side again, Mike Ash taking a small trade against Vinze. Still have his, has the Dominus, trying to keep priority over this top side wave but yeah due to the recall this is the rotation i was waiting for blue whites recognize the situation able to scare them because i'm pretty much free objective with the power spike still missing from the side of anima thing that can really be done right here out of anima and the early stages of this game are going incredibly well for blue whites but that's what we're expecting these lanes are winning matchups this jungler is a little bit better at early lane ganking. It's the team fights and the skirmishes where Anima are really going to be able to come online, and that's the point that Anima is waiting for. Dominus. Popping in, it has the Galio ultimate. There's a follow up by Cash. Oh, they don't deal enough damage. One auto is away. A Wednesday flashes just in time to save himself. Oh, so, so close right there. Vinze just about going to be able to survive, and that opens up a Rift Herald for Frost. Not going to decide to go to it. Instead, just going to roam past. See the idea, Pomo and Boltox, they might be walking into a bit of a trap right now. They are no level 6 on the Nautilus, instead going for the JSL. Oh, two flashes now down from the side of Blue Whites. They were on the rotation to save the Herald, but it wasn't even started, and now they lose two flashes for basically nothing. Really, really well bred out of Anima right there. Knew that Blue Whites knew that they wanted to go for this Herald. It's oh. a Belveth, of course you want to go for the Herald. A lot of champions though roaming around. There is the potential of a flank right here by Vinze. My cash yeah. pretty low. My cash getting chunked down already, but the fight is now oh, starting. No. Another candle on the crash down. Boltox on top of those, not letting Anima contest this Herald. Oh. That's going to be able to pick up Frost right there. And sure, the bait was decent, but at this point, all of the members of Anima are scattered, having to run.